I, I am behaving like Professor Jeffries these days. <laughs> As you see, I have my books. 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 And a lot of notes. So you're going to have to sit down and listen to me. And I'm back in my jacket. That tells you what that means. My topic this evening is an extremely serious one. It is serious, made even more serious because it is not ventilated very often. And we in the United States of America are suffering from a lot of mendacity on this subject. Because there are those in this country who have been promulgating consistently in the last 40 years that all our salvation will come from embracing Islam. Our salvation will come from realizing that we are the Asiatic black man. Our salvation will come when we say that Muhammad is the prophet and everybody else is wrong. And that that is our original religion. But none of this is true. None of this is true. Christianity is no more our religion than Islam is our religion than that we are Hebrew Israelites or anything else. The African has always had his own religion and there's enough scholarship that has been done to tell you some of the great religions that we have starting in Egypt and Nubia and Kush. We have been the most religious people of the world. But unfortunately, each wave of conquerors that has come in has brought his religion. And this is to be expected because religion is the opiate of the masses in fact and in truth. With religion, you can turn a religious people into believing that when you lash them, it is something good for them, and that you do it only because you are thinking of their interest. Strange enough, you will justify anything because your mind has been conditioned to believe that is the will of God, and that you are submitting to God. My topic this evening is, on the, uh, is a double-edged double topic. It's the Arab invasion of Africa and the Arab slave trade in Africa. But it's essentially about the relationships of Arabs and Africans in Africa. So I will have to start out by dealing first of all with the Africans, who we were and whence we came. Then I will talk about the Arabs, who they are and whence they came. Who are we? Asiatic black man? The work of Leakey, the Leakeys, 1959, in the Alduvai Gorge on the borders of Kenya and Tanzania, where they discovered remains of Homo sapiens. And we have to be careful to distinguish between Homo sapiens and Homo sapiens sapiens, as Brother Sheikh Antadiop will tell us, because that is our stages in the evolution of man. But Homo sapien is the first day man that is erect and has the features of man in the nature of walk and gait. In 1959 research showed that male fossil remains dated from 1,700,000 BC were found in this area, unmistakably African. Further work showed female remains dating from 2 million BC, unmistakably African. These are the earliest remains of Homo sapiens anywhere in the world. You will see conflicting statements written by Europeans or Asiatics, uh, Asians, whatever you want to call them, who will say otherwise. But careful research will show that this is all a lie and that lies have been told about Africa for so many years, hundreds of years, because people wanted to make the African feel that he had never achieved anything in the history of the world. Uh, if you look on the map, it's very difficult to see it there, but remember where, if somebody could, who is near the map will point out roughly where the border of Kenya and Tanzania is. Then having pointed out where the border of Kenya and Tanzania is, Kenya and Tanzania there, then let us look down to Egypt and see where the, uh, the Nile enters the Mediterranean uh, through that little isthmus there okay now it is our thesis 
that civilization came from this area where man first started and came down the Nile. And that is the essence of modern scholarship. Now, when I make that term modern scholarship, I'm not saying that the people in the ancient world didn't believe this. The people in the ancient world knew this. They knew that civilization came down the Nile. They never had any doubt about it. But we had a piece of scholarship that started about 300 years ago when, when the Europeans enslaved us that changed all of this thinking. And then you had a whole set of scholars, first order liars who distorted history and produced a scholarship that said civilization came up the Nile because the Egyptians were white people. Totally and absolutely untrue. So Africans emerged out of this Garden of Eden, if you want to call it that. And we came down the Nile, but we went in other directions too. We went in other directions too. So that it's not only Egyptian civilization, there's other civilizations in Africa are very old. And the reason why we get so much about Egyptian civilization is because Egypt has been so near to Europe, so it has been so carefully examined. We, we have Zimbabwe in the other direction and nobody knows how things happened there because scholars have not really invested the time on researching that. We look also at the situation as we move down this Nile and realize that by about 10,000 BC, we were already beginning to lay the foundations of orderly agriculture in Africa, in what is called Kemet and Nubia. Okay? And at this time, Everybody else in the world was in a state of primeval darkness. We have, in the concept of Africa, a cutoff along the northern part of Africa where the historians tell us that the people above this line are undeniably white people who belong to a white race. Then a little later now, when more facts have hit them, they start saying they are a Euro-Asian people, Euro-Asian people, who are light-skinned, white. You know, they can't exactly say white, but light-skinned people. They are, of course, not African. Well, there's a great man who came out of Africa. Perhaps the greatest intellectual of our time. And he wasn't born anywhere in the West. He was born in Senegal. This man was an anthropologist and a historian, a mathematician and a physicist. And I love this man because I'm like this man. See, you see me researching history, but my trade is mathematics, physics, and electronics. See, she can't deal perhaps the greatest intellectual of all race in the 20th century. And he was able to disprove all these theories. And his great other book, as many of you do know, is Civilization and Bar or Barbarism. Now what Sheikh Ander Diop has told us, and if we think about it, it can't be too far wrong, is that these Mediterranean peoples called Berbers and Carthaginians they were never anywhere in Africa before 1500 BC. But 1500 BC is late developmental chart of Africa. So Africans must have been in all of that Mediterranean, a solid mass of Africans, all going into Europe in the time around 2000 BC. As a matter of fact, we do know from history that the Phoenicians the granddaddies of the Carthaginians came over into North Africa in 800 BC. Now you wonder why I'm taking so much time about this, because it's a question of whose land, whose land, who is a righteous owner of the land, the brother from the PSC, speaking about that. And that's why we in the UNINA said, by the way, I'm Marcus Garvey Jr. President General of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League of the World. 
in the direct line of descent from Marcus Garvey, seventh president general, and I'm doing my father's work. And my father's work is resumption of Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. And that cannot change. Now, I just heard a brother say why they recognize why they turned against Mandela. Why I turned against Mandela finally was when my, a friend in England sent me a copy of a piece of work by Mr. Mandela many years ago in which he said that he has turned his back upon the philosophies of Marcus Garvey. And I said if Nelson Mandela turned his back upon the philosophies of Marcus Garvey, then I, Marcus Garvey Jr., is certainly going to turn my back upon the philosophies of Mark Nelson Mandela. Now, Let us have a look. These are the African people who spread out from that Garden of Eden all over Africa. And, by, and, and we can say that there ain't was nobody there in Africa from 2000 BC backwards. They came after. Don't care what part of Africa you look at. Now let's look at the Arabs. The Arabs are the people of Arabia. And you look across the Red Sea, if somebody just point out the Red Sea there, and point out Arabia for me. There it is. There it is in the corner. In the northeast of Africa, to the northeast, there is Arabia. That's where the Arabs come from. It's, here you talk with Professor Clark, you're talking about a sand people, a nomadic people. A lot of nomadic people in those times. The Chinese were wandering across the Gobi Desert. Yes, sir. They hadn't built any civilization. When we had a civilization, when we had a civilization, yes, third page on, on your map, on, on, on the handout. I remember to, the, way, the way to read it so that the legend comes in the left-hand corner. Okay? Now, these Arabian people, and here's where a little, a, a little investigation helps us. These Arabian people, look across again, next door, across the Red Sea, what do you see? Now somewhere down there, I don't have it on the map, but on all the maps of the ancient world, you'd see near the bottom of the Red Sea, you'd see the names Mero and Aksum. And some of you who have listened to lectures by Professor Clark and um, Dr. Ben will have heard these words about Mero and Aksum. It's not on that map because it would be on the ancient maps, but it would be in, in the Sudan. The River. In between the Akbar River and the Blue Nile. See if you can track it out. It's push, go up a little more and a little to the right, and there you'll see Mero and a little lower down Aksum. Those were great nations that existed in those days. Now, those areas were called loosely, loosely, Ethiopia. And the Ethiopians, the Ethiopians were made excursions into Arabia from early areas. And, and Arabs came across the Red Sea back, were brought back across the Red Sea by Africans. I'm going to make statements about the introduction of Arabs into Africa. But the statements I make do not take into account what was happening there. I want to read from the African origin of civilization, myth or reality, this statement. But you have to understand that there was activity across there, battles between Arabs and other Semitic people who were in that Arabian Peninsula, and our people in Meru Aksum in the Ethiopian heartland there. And this was happening a couple hundred years before the main Arab body moved out because they couldn't move in force across the Red Sea in those days. Moved higher up and that's the invasion I'll be talking about later and that's really when the weight of the Arabs came over. But they came, and after that they kept coming across the Red Sea as they developed their skills. 
But let me point out something to you which is not pointed out. Page 151 of the African Origin of Civilization, Mythi or Reality, Sheikh Antadio. And I'll go to the previous paragraph. Reisner, which is one of these fake European, and George Andrew Reisner, fake great Egyptologist, uh, Diop says, he could not have failed to know that Nubian civilization dates back to 1500 BC. That is to say, prior to the appearance of the white Japhetic Libyan in Africa. Consequently, the problem is not to seek Libyans in recent Nubian history, but to find some at the start of that civilization about 5000 BC. This task, Reisner was careful not to attempt. Then he says, when Muhammad was born, Arabia was a Negro colony with Mecca as its capital. The Quran refers to the army of 40,000 men sent by the king of Ethiopia to crush the Arab revolt. One core of that army consisted of warriors mounted on elephants. Heard that before? The Romans know that, don't they? What was his name? Hannibal. De La Fosse himself is obliged to record that suzerainty of Ethiopia over Arabia. You can research this yourself. Has Minister Farrakhan or any of the great proponents of Islam in this country told us that in the time of the Muhammad, the Prophet, there was an army of 40,000 Africans in Arabia? Have you heard this? I beg you, my children, have you heard it? No. Of course you won't hear it. Of course you won't hear it. You will hear that you are the Asiatic black man. <laughs> Asiatic black man. The only way a black man gets into Asia is because he left Africa and went there. What? Now, 622 AD, four men Right, travel by camel from Mecca to Medina. Mecca to Medina. And that is the beginning of things. The beginning of things. This is where the Arabs start to get moving with their philosophy of Islam, their religion. What is this great state, single statement? There is no God but God. Muhammad is the messenger of God. And this is the message that is taken throughout Arabia and unites these sand people, these desert people, into a warlike band to spread their religion of Islam. Muhammad dies in 632 AD. And uh, immediately, this, the followers of Muhammad the caliphs go on the war path and the first place that they overrun is Syria from 634 to 636 AD. On your map, that's a little to the right up there, there is a kind of orange spot, Syria. Someone can point it out for us, Syria, Damascus. It's on the third page up in the right hand corner a little bit. But, oh, check, check your map, I forgot I, you have it with you, check your third sheet, all right? 634 to 636. Find conquest in Syria and they move further out in that direction. Now, they look the other direction and say, let's go the other way. And what's, what's, what's in the other way? Egypt. Kemet. And they enter Egypt in 639 AD. Brothers and sisters, before these Arabs came to Egypt in 639 AD, there was no significant presence of Arabs in Africa. They are not native to Africa. They were native to the Arabian Peninsula. They were a wild nomadic people with no civilization to speak of. No civilization to speak of. At that time, our civilization 
was, to put it very mildly, certainly over 6,000 years old. It could have been as much as 10,500 years old. Because if you talk about civilization, you talk about a settled agriculture, established towns. Remember, these are Bedouin horsemen. They are roaming all over the place, just moving their tents. That is not civilization. That is nothing. They don't grow their own food. They chop off people and head and, ca and capture food. That is what they were. So how could they be the light of the world? Now, let us go to the very words of Chancellor Williams. For this is an epic time, this entry into... I want to get things right here. Yes. I'm going to use Chancellor Williams' versions. Um, there is information in this book, which is a very good book, Oliver and Fage on the a Short History of Africa. There is some information in here, I read from Davidson, but Davidson has to be treated with the reservation, supposed to be the doyen of historians, but he's a white man speaking with white reservations. He can only see history in the paternalistic uh, sense of the white man being the great father of civilization and he builds his stories to accept that. And if he can't get a white man, then he gets a proto-white man to be in the civilization. Okay? Now, they conquered Egypt, and that's the northern part above the first cataract. Yes, really there where we see, roughly where you see Egypt today. Very quickly. Uh, by six, uh, by 643, they had essentially taken over the whole of Egypt in four years. And they had done this with an army of 4,000 men. And we have to remember, um, perhaps I should make a diversion before I do this for us to understand why it was so easy to... Um, take Egypt. Egypt as it then was had only a minority of Africans in Egypt. The, it was the Europeanized and the mulatto and offspring of mixtures of black and white who were in power in Egypt. It was not the Africans themselves. They were now below the first cataract. They were in Nubia proper. And we can just go through the series of invasions which weakened upper Egypt. As a matter of fact, I will start at 663 BC, but there were other invasions before that, uh, notably the Hyksos and um, other Semitic peoples. But at 663 BC, this was one of the great onslaughts that really moved us back. The Assyrians sacked Thebes, 663 BC. The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, mm -hmm. and the sheen of his spears were like stars on the sea when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. You see, why do I stress the Assyrian invasion? Because that was when we had what is called a technological gap. The African, who had smelted iron so many years before, used iron in domestic purposes Whereas the Assyrian used iron for warfare. We were still using bronze for warfare, bronze weapons. And the steel, of course, is a much more deadly weapon than a bronze sword or spear. Technological gap. And there was no reason why it should have existed, because we had the knowledge, but we did not apply that knowledge. See, that was one of the things, you see. The second great invasion was that of the Persians in 525 BC. Now, in between 525 BC, uh, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with that. I would, I would go before that and the great work of Pianchi, but we don't need to deal with that before 
because 63 BC was a time when after that time we were never really a force in Egypt again. You see? So, but there was another Persian invasion in 525 BC. Again, these are the object of these are softening up Egypt. Then came the Greeks under Alexander, 332 BC. Again, softening up, softening up. But notice that all of these people, one thing about them, they weren't going below the first cataract to meet the, the mass power of the Africans. <laughs> 31 BC, the Romans. Great conqueror, perhaps the greatest of all the conquerors in the time. And they stayed there for a long time. Then came the Arabs. So we know that by now, Egypt was easy to, to knock off. Then, <laughs> 643 AD, uh, and Abdullah, the Arab governor, the viceroy of Egypt. You see, they, everywhere that the Arabs went, they set up their, their viceroys because they are now being ruled from Damascus and Baghdad. He decided that he was going to go south. He was going to go where nobody else had gone before. Everybody stopped. We wanted to go into the land of the blacks. Bilad as Sudan. Yes, and he had uh, a much bigger army now. And he advanced below the first cataract. And um, what happened was something that has happened so again and again in Africa. We moved back and they came in. Moved back and they came in. We didn't engage them frontally. And they said, oh man, these Africans are not as tough as they thought we were. They're running. <laughs> well, they were caught into the heartland of Nubia. And they were put to the sword. And the agent of destruction was the great um, phalanxes of African bowmen who shot with deadly accuracy and cut down the Arabs. That was the first defeat of the Arabs after they burst out of their lair in Arabia to terrorize the world. First formal defeat. Now, uh, in reading some books, there was one book which I didn't even bother to bring. Because the brother writing about this, uh, I should never have used that word. The Aryan writing about this time said that he feels that it must have been something about the African armies and their bowmen that caused the Arabs to return or retreat. He couldn't bear to make the word that black men had defeated Arabs who were white people in warfare. It's terrible to read books like that. This battle is not uh, given in battles in the history of the world. It is not given, if you read the history of the world about the great battles of the world, it's not given. Now there were over 100,000 Africans fighting on one side, and there were at least that amount, if not more, of Arabs on the other side. But I pause here to remind you of another battle, which was not reported in history. And this is the great battle under the Emperor Menelik at Adawa in 1896, when the great Italian army marched into Ethiopia, as it was then called Abyssinia in the same way, they were drawn into the interior. But no, this battle was not fought at Bumi, for the Emperor Menelik had purchased heavy artillery and machine guns from the Prussians and the Swedes, and had been trained proficiently in their use for many years, you see. Because he knew what was coming, because the Italians had been given a protectorate by the Congress of Berlin, that infamous part, European party where they sliced up Africa and painted the colors of each European nation on it. But to put it short, at a dawa, when they came in between the two mountain ranges, Menelik had them. And the bombardment that ensued with those heavy artillery on the higher mountain ranges on the machine gun posts at the lower right into the Italians, over 40,000 were dead. 
at a door. That battle is not recorded in history either. I'll give you a third feat recorded in history, but which has been recovered from the annals of the British War Office and the French. Napoleon was defeated by the giants of Haiti with the loss of a hundred thousand men, the French. And he was, his armies were led by his brother-in-law, Le Kirk. This is not documented in history, but has been hidden in the records of the French War, war Office. The British, the cocky British followed, they said, they, they, they will conquer Haiti and, and, uh, and, 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 and those arrogant Africans. They were they suffered the worst defeat the British army had suffered for some 200 years. 100,000 British dead in Haiti. So we must all lift our hats to the great men of Haiti. And remember, history does not record that either. So when we win, history does not talk about it. When we lose, Now, after this repulse in 643 AD, the Arabs, like all white people, lick their wounds for a while, but they are coming back at you. And they came back in 1651 in tremendous numbers. See? In tremendous numbers. And the Africans now had to retreat. And their capital city was attacked and eventually taken. But they did not give up the fight. They came back in more numbers and numbers. And they fought the Arabs to a standstill. And when the Arabs decided they had to retreat, they sued for a peace. And unfortunately, brothers and sisters, we let them have a peace and an arrangement. Now one of the th things of this peace was, it was called a backed or annual tribute to be paid to the Arabs. And it's been emphasized that these are, this is terminology because the Arabs had to pay payments to the Africans. But the unfortunate payment that we elected, our ancestors elected to make, was to deliver 360 slaves near the frontier each year, plus 40 extra slaves as a gift to the Egyptian viceroy. In exchange for this, we got wheat, barley, and wine, far in excess of the value of the slaves, but the damage was done. For now we had legalized the taking of slaves of our people over to Arabia. So the invasion of Africa continued. If you look on your map, you'll see a place called Karukan, Keruan that the Arabs reached in 670 AD. This was in southern Tunisia. The Arabs were also moving in the opposite direction as I told you. But let us concentrate on them sweeping across Africa, the north of Africa. They reached Carthage in 695 AD. And soon after, I think by about 705, they were looking right on the Atlantic. And this was an achievement for these desert rats who had come out of their sand holes only a few years before, but now they were conquering. And they didn't stop in Africa. For they entered Spain in 711 AD. Now when you talk about Africa, uh, Arabs conquering us in Africa, they were conquering a lot of other people too. And I, I want to, this fact to be emphasized. We made our mistakes. But we beat them, we fought them to a standstill in our land, there in the Sudan, in Nubia. They entered Spain in 711, and they were in Portugal in 713. And they were in France in 714 AD. How many of you knew that the Arabs were in France? Yes, they were. And they were prowling around in France 
And they weren't only looking at the scenery or drinking the wine. And they were there in Europe until Charles Martel the Hammer defeated them at Poitiers in 732 AD and pushed them back across the Pyrenees into Spain. And you know how long they stayed in Spain. Now, at this time now, the Arabs did control the whole of that pinch up on the north there. You could see the track across that last sheet. The Arabs now control the whole of that area. But there were Arabs now who were probing across the Red Sea, moving across the Red Sea also. And these invasions became more important subsequently. Now what happened during this, after this invasion, was that the, the pressure of the Arabs continued. And in this process, they were spreading the religion of Islam. And this religion of Islam was now coming across the Sahara, for they're moving across the Sahara, although we still head firm in Nubia. And the two kingdoms that we had in Nubia were Makuria and Alwa. And after the, the, what we have to realize is that although they were coming across the Sudan, they were held over there, uh, I mean the Sahara. Remember the Sahara, just point out the stretch of the Sahara all the way across, right across out to the Atlantic Ocean, see? Right across there. So all that stretch they were coming across. Now, in coming across, they were meeting other African nations there. And those nations were becoming Islamized, see? But there was, so there was invasion coming across the Sahara. Now, they looked at the Sudan, and for 500, uh, over 500 years, they could not penetrate there. The penetration happened in the 13th century. And here we have the dynastic problems that we have had in Africa. As a matter of fact, this is one of the first examples in the more modern history where a nephew of the king went who went to the Sultan in Cairo. If you notice, you'll see Fostat. That was the old Arab name. First that became Cairo. And that's why first that is on, on, on that old map. And he intervened. So this navy of the king wanted to wanted the throne for himself. He can't wait to be a king. So he goes to the Hisham says, Crown me king, and I will rule for you. <laughs> Well, eventually he did, because of this, there's a division in the land among those who follow him or not. Well, when he became king and the other king was overthrown, what do you think the Arabs? Now the Arabs put their demands to him, and he was not strong enough to resist them, and they wiped him out. But there was still Alwa. Still Alwa. And that nation, down in the Sudan, remained until the 16th century, when the mass forces of the Arabs striking from different directions overran them. So from the time that the Arabs came into Africa in 639, they did not secure the whole of the Sudan until 900 years lo later. And it shows that our ancestors were incredible warriors to hold out against the whole pressure of the Muslim, because remember that these people overran uh, all the way into Turkey. They, I mean, they went up into Turkey. Show them up in the Caucasus they were up there. Look on that map and show the directions that those Arabs were taking their march. I mean, we, we just have a, uh, recently looking at Yugoslavia. Oh, look at those white Muslims here. 
because the Arabs came there and that made them Muslims. So we are, we are looking at recent history. We, we, we see the effect of that drive of the Arabs. So the Arabs are an invading, thieving people and an Arab, an Englishman, a white American, a Frenchman, a German, they're all the same breed. Amen. Yeah. Thieving, slave trading people. If any of you have Arab names, you can change them and give them, get yourself some real African names. I mean, and don't say, wow, well, Marcus, why do you keep this Irish name of Garvey? It's because my father distinguished it so much, I can't change it. <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, those are the classical invasion routes, and you see them coming, you know, like termites across the Red Sea, year after year, year after year. They're not all the time they're coming in swords and shields, you know. They come in to trade and probe. I mean, they were spying. They're checking out the land, infiltrating, infiltrating, infiltrating. And that's the whole story. You sit down in South Africa and you let this cracker stay there. He's in Namibia. He's in Zimbabwe. Tell it. And there are going to be more and more of them coming. I mean, you hear that some are leaving. For everyone that leaves, there's going to be three that come in. Remember where we are. Where are we? 400 years ago, who was here making a powwow right here in Newark? Hmm? Weakling. Hmm? Weakling. Yes. Yes. The red man. The American. The American. <laughs> you go on a reservation and tell him that you're the American. <laughs> he tell you something. He's still here, but he's on a reservation. Do we want to be on the reservations in Africa? Do we want to be on the reservations in the Caribbean? I mean, already now they're taking up all that lovely sea, land by the sea, buying it up. Americans, Canadians, Germans, British, French. They don't mind having villas beside each other. They just speak a little different language, but they're all buddy boys. That's something we have to learn. White people may have a quarrel among themselves, but when they see you in the distance, they come together like this. Yeah, boy. That's why a Russian can come all the way from Russia here, and an apartment is found for him in Brooklyn. Yes, sir, an assistance is found for him in Brooklyn. He's a ready-made refugee. <laughs> but if you're a black man from the Caribbean or West Africa or Southern Africa, and you have spent three years to get a visa to come to the United States, you're not an idiot, because if you're an idiot, you cannot come into the United States. You try to get anything like what that Russian is going to get. They only tell you to go and look for some work and you ain't never going to get work like the skills that you had when you come in here. You're going to have to steer here and fight for five years before you can even get a decent job. But an Englishman, a New Zealander, an Australian, they come in here, boy, and they're all set two weeks after they come. They know everything. They know where to get everything and every kind of assistance. They are well taken care of. You think about that. Brothers and sisters, we want to look now at slavery and the slave trade. Uh, I want to talk, and I'm going to have to be jumping around again from book to book. We said before that official slavery in Africa and I need to emphasize this official Arab slavery in Africa really started from 652 AD. And it grew and grew and grew. Now I want to make this statement so for your own records. It should be noted that slaves had been sent to Arabia from Kush, Mero, and Aksum, modern Ethiopia and Somalia, across the Red Sea intermittently and sporadically for some 250 years before 652 AD. However, the formal institutionalized 
regular trading in African humanity conducted by the Arabs of North Africa and the Middle East began at this time. Okay? Now let's look at the Eastern trading pa patterns. The slave trade had three routes. First, across the Sahara to North Africa. And uh, North African countries of Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Libya is the big one, and Egypt, and Egypt. So if you look at the top part, you're going right across there. They cross the Sahara. And immediately I want to tell you that crossing the Sahara in those days was no mean feat. You're looking from the takeoff point where the slaves were captured, and you're looking at the top of Nigeria, go down now, yes, the coast, the back coast there, further up the coast, more inland, right, across there. You see, you look across that, that pole across there, you're looking at six, six, seven hundred, seven hundred miles in those caravans, across that sand. Shackle, shackle. I know you see the dense pack for the, for the middle passage, but the conditions in those Arab caravans, they were no fun. And to move across that desert of 600 miles, you're looking at a journey of one and a half months. Yes, sir, 45 days in that heat. And all you have to have is a miscalculation in your water supply and you die of thirst. Now, in this book, one of these books here, I was making a study and there was a caravan. And this was not in the early days of slavery. This was something in the 17th century where a caravan arrived in the north and 1,000 African slaves had perished from thirst in crossing over the Sahara. Yes, my brothers and sisters, as much as you hear about the Middle Passage, going across the Sahara was a terrible thing. Bound with the little children crying by their mothers. The neck collar, the leg brace, across that sand, that burning heat. The trading process consisted of the capture by force of the Africans in the interior. We want to emphasize that the overwhelming majority of slaves were obtained by warfare or kidnapping. Now there were African tribes who were selling African, but the only way they got Africans were to attack and seize them. Ain't nobody walking into slavery of his own free will, man, woman, or child. So it's warfare and kidnapping. Don't tell anybody, anybody tell you that getting slaves was a benign adventure and that people were better off in slavery than they were otherwise. I mean, I, I think you all have read these little fairy stories in the white man's books. Now the march of the captives to the coast or Saharan border town. And some of these border towns are famous to this day. Walata, the Zen. And I think, you may not be able to catch it on that map, Timbuktu and Kano in northern Nigeria. These were the great um, slave towns where the huge pens of slaves were kept. You see, a caravan didn't cross the Sahara every day. If you're looking at the Atlantic now, a ship didn't come take off from Gori Island every day. So you're pinned there in these forts or stockades in these great towns in, in across Sahara in the case of the Arab slave trade. And what do you think of the conditions there? Nice. You keep them in the slave pens until the caravans arrive. Then they travel across the Sahara or across the Red Sea and the other trip pathway was the Indian Ocean. You see, because you, those were the three pathways. The Red Sea into Arabia and across the Indian Ocean to India. Now there's another takeoff point from India where our slave ancestors were taken by the Portuguese and carried around India and into China and even into Japan. And this is one of the things that surprised me when I heard from people who had been there 
and who had studied this, that they are Africans in China to this day, who are the descendants of African slaves. So we are truly a universal people. Now, Marcus Garvey knew this. That's why he had created the Universal Negro Improvement Association. You see, we got all the way down into Australia. In the New Guinea, you see our people down there. We are very traveled people. So we didn't only travel as slaves, but we travel as freed men up and all over the place going on down. We have spread our race. Why? Because we were the first people on earth, period. Second, we were the first civilized people on earth. And that's two great firsts. Now the Arab slave trader brought his African merchandise to a broker in a large town who put them up for sale in the slave market. Now among the many brokers that were there in the Arab world, there were some brokers who don't like to be remembered now in the United States of America. These were the Jewish brokers who were in all the great towns such as Damascus and Baghdad. Yes. Yes, sir. What a lot of trouble Professor Jeffries got into. And all he talked about was a Jew, old Jew over there in Newport, Rhode Island. But what about the Jews of Amsterdam? The Jews of Lisbon? The Jews of Cadiz? Hmm? The Jews of Toulouse? A Marseille? The Jews of Bristol? The great slave port of England? Bristol. Because that's where the great voyages were planned. Who had the money to put those ships on the sea to send them out for three months and to take that route over to Africa and back again? Who had the money to finance these huge caravans to go and fetch slaves across? Who were the great merchants of the Middle East? Who were the great merchants of Europe? Answer me, brothers and sisters, who were they? Jews! So how the hell they weren't in the slave trade? They never cared about how they turned an honest dollar. Honest. And we have... <laughs> well, from their point of view, it's an honest dollar. Although they are lamenting the fact now and denying it. Now, slaves, after you bought their slaves from the broker, they were used in domestic service as servants and here is what the Arabs did that not even the deadly Europeans did to us, except when they were real mad. They made us eunuchs. Eunuchs. So I heard somebody say, what? A eunuch means that they castrated the African black man. And these were there to guard the harems of the wealthy and the powerful. And we were also used as soldiers to fight for the Arabs. Don't look so strange. You were used as soldiers right here in the United States of America by a man called Honest Abe Lincoln. And he used you when he needed you. Hmm? Fight. But we have always fought for other people. Fought to build other empires. Now, more limited use was made of African slaves in agriculture, mining, and industry than was used in the Western slave trade. And this is how the Eastern slave trade differed. The principal areas that supplied slaves for the Eastern trade, and these varied in importance over the approximately 1,250 years of the trade. Because I'm talking, I am saying here, 1,250 years, and I, I want you to understand that effectively, from about 1900, the African trade, uh, the, uh, the Arab slave trade went down, was with, with decline because of the anti-slave conventions of the time. But Arabs never stopped trading in African slaves. As a matter of fact, the last legalized um, slave, um, uh, ask legalized ab abolition of slavery, and I remember I'm saying legalized because I'm using the word advisedly, was in Mauritania and this was in 1980, as late as 1980. So up to 1980 it was legal by the laws of Mauritania for Arabs to have Africans as slaves. Now, I am credibly informed and in my visit to Africa uh, as their last year in Egypt, that slavery is still being carried on where young blacks 
who go on the Hajj never return from the Hajj. They are enslaved in Saudi Arabia and transported to other parts of the Arab world still as slaves. So the Arab has, will not give up his fiendish ways, his love of African flesh for his own purposes. Now the regions from where the slaves came from were the coastlands of, and we remember now I'm talking about the Arab slave trade, were the coastlands of Kenya and Tanzania. Kenya and Tanzania, look, look where they were there. The coast of Somalia, higher up, yes, where uh, the US forces are now. Abyssinia, which is modern Ethiopia, Nubia, and the area between the Niger and the Atlantic coast. That's over on the other side. You see, the area between the Niger and the Atlantic coast, and a, a wide, huge area around Lake Chad, which is a little higher up to the right. Lake Chad, yes. And of course there you have the movement straight across the Sahara into Morocco and Tunisia and Algeria. Uh, some people will say that Arab slavery was kinder than European slavery, that's a joke, no slave master, you have to understand something, I don't care who you are, you are not naturally a slave, you have to be made to be a slave, when somebody catches a free man or a free woman or a free child, they don't consent to be slaves, you have to do, the thing that they all use was a thing called seasoning, that means when you get, they get the slave first, you have to train him to be a slave. And what was the, tr the tool of training? Whip. Whip. And everybody used the whip on the African. Whether every kind of European, German, Frenchman, Italian, Spaniard, every Portuguese, everybody used the whip. And believe me, the Arabs used the whip too. Now, the cruelty of the Arabs is very well known. You see, they, they used to castrate you. Well, you know. No, they castrate you just without you doing anything. Now, imagine when you did something to really make them mad. See? The thing about slavery in the Arab world is that the proportion of domestic slaves, house slaves, was much greater. So in a sense, because a plantation slave um, was... Okay, all right, good. I have to use... Domestic slavery you don't have to use, once a slave has been broken, you don't have to use the whip, like in plantation slavery. You see, in plantation slavery, you're trying to make a man, a man and a woman, work 12 to 14 hours a day, six and perhaps seven days a week. Now, you need special stimuli to make people work like that. It ain't, it ain't normal, it ain't normal. See? And that's why plantation slavery was more brutal. And, um, there was a reason why there were more domestic slaves in the Arab world. They were not used after thing. And one of the great reasons is the, what happened in the century, I want to get the century right here. Okay. It's the ninth century. That means century that has the 800s in it. And it was the revolt of the Zanj. And these were East African slaves from areas that are now part of Kenya and Tanzania. And these were used by, these Zanj were used by the Arabs in the ninth century to drain the salt marshes at the mouth of the Tigris 
on the Euphrates. Now, uh, you may not, I don't think you're going to be able to see it on that map, but you, the Tigris and the Euphrates are up there uh, going through Iraq and Syria there, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Yes, up there. Now the salt marsh is there. That's a tremendous job. And um, around Basra, if you remember the last little brew, the little rumble that they had over, over there in Iraq, that they were fighting around Basra, and I said, ah, that's where all people stood up against the Arabs a thousand years before. We didn't know. You had black Americans over there, African Americans in Basra, and they didn't know that was a land of glory for a race. You see, and uh, the, the, these slaves were being used for the preparation of land for sugar cultivation. In 868, uh, tens of thousands of African slaves of Zanj, and most of them were a fairly recent importation. I want to stop here. Remember Haiti? What was the thing about the Haitian Revolution in recent, the 1790s? Recent, recent importation of slaves from Africa. So they still had freedom, smelling freedom strong in their noses. See what I mean? Hey, when you get the Africans smelling freedom strong in their nose, boy, you better watch out. And these Zanj rebelled against the conditions of their enslavement. And the rebellion was very successful initially. Now, remember what I said they were using us as soldiers. African troops of the Caliph's guard sent to fight them defected and joined forces with their African brothers. Yeah. And the Zanj extended the area and scope of their operations, building a capital city at Al Muqtara and another fortified town at Al Mania. And the classical book for this is Hunwick. Uh, and he has written, uh, nothing, none of these books have this stuff, on black Africans in the Islamic world. Now, by 1870, they had captured the flourishing seaport of Ubula, and in 1871, they sacked Basra. This enormous slaughter of the Arabs. Now, Basra is near, is on the border of Iraq, pretty close to Kuwait. By 1878, the major city of Wazit had been captured, and the Zanj forces were raiding within 17 miles of Baghdad, the heart of the great Arab Empire. They had defeated a succession of Arab armies sent against them. So the Arabs now had to come back from all their possessions all over the Arab Empire to defend Baghdad. And it was the entire Arab armies plus treachery, plus treachery, there's always treachery, who defeated the Zanj in 1880. They attacked the Zanj in 1880 and uh, took three years to defeat them. After those tremendous battles, which almost caused the overthrow of the whole Arab empire, the Arabs never used Africans in plantation slavery again. And they learned a lesson which was passed on to the wicked white man of the West. Never to put Africans of the same nation or from the same area together in on your plantations. For you are certain that they are going to revolt. And that is what happened to us and why we had such difficulty in the United States and also in the Caribbean and South America. Because they divided us up. In fact, the Portuguese made this mistake most of all, and that's why there were so many uh, very powerful slave uh, rev revolts in Brazil uh, until they uh, studied their history and corrected it. Now, I want to talk about uh, how many, and it takes, you see, we're talking about slavery and the slave trade. And we're talking about people being slaughtered here, people being whipped to death, and all that. But how many died in the slave trade? And I'm only going to confine myself naturally to the um, 
Eastern slave trade, the Arab slave trade. Now when you are looking at records uh, to try to come to a conclusion as to how many Africans died in the Eastern slave trade, the first problem you come about is the number of areas of loss where there are no statistics available. Where would you find the documents uh, that detail the caravans that cross the Sahara? Now that is not, I mean, fictitious because those documents are somewhere, but those documents are the hands of Arabs or they may have been destroyed. So an African historian can't get his hands on them. Now the European is different in that you can go to the British uh, Marine Department or whatever it is, or the French Marine, and if you were, you can actually look up those documents. The Europeans like to keep documents. But the Arabs are very cunning and they don't keep documents. They ain't going, and if they keep them, they're not going to let you get them. Think about Arab dangerous people. No, even if you could get the documents, the records are never complete. Because the documents will only show legal transactions. I mean, now let us look back across the Atlantic here. Now, you know slaves were coming in all along the time believe that every slave ship that came in came in legally and stopped in the port and went to the harbor master and he signed up and they checked them on the slaves in there oh no a lot of those slave ships dumped their cargoes along the coast just like you have all that good old coke coming in here now <laughs> how does it get in right prohibition how did all the liquor where did all the liquor come from you're trying to stop it but it was coming in so there were always large number of slaves ventures that were not legal, they were off the record. Because think of it, if you're going to go to a broker in Damascus, you have to come in legally. What about the little, if, if you have a set of slaves that you keep outside of Damascus and you come inside and say, I got some slaves. You know, because whenever you come into the town you go to the broker, he has to pay a tax. Because he's in the central market. Every market that you are in is taxed. Now you want to obviate the tax on slaves, you know how to do it. Now another thing is that the historians who present the tactics have been usually white, Europeans or Arabs, and have a vested interest in minimizing the Holocaust of African people. The data is contained in records of many different Arab countries, written in a variety of languages, and entered over long periods of time. Even the Arab languages change over those long periods of time. You're talking about 1,300 years. How are you going to get at those records? But what we do know is that African lives were lost in the following ways. Forcible capture in the home, the village, or town. Men, women, and children were seized. Look at the picture, the first picture on your map. Men, women, and children. And when a mother got killed, those slave traders weren't going to take those little babies that were left and carry them across the Sahara. They just left them to die. In the process of captures, mothers and fathers were separated from their children, the children perished. Slaves, as we said, were taken because of in, in the, in the, in, as a result of wars. The march to the, across to the Saharan border town. If you're captured in Africa, remember you have to go to this Saharan border town, somewhere across that Sahara, where, you, where you're put in those slave pens and that's, a dist that's the first distance you have to travel. And that distance could be easily 100 miles, or 150 miles, through, through bush, dense vegetation. Now, in the slave pens, there you were waiting for the caravan. And the conditions were generally not very good. If you're penning cattle, and slaves, are, those slaves were very important, but you, you, you don't take care of them like you take care of your family. Then there was a journey across the Sahara, the Red Sea, or the Indian Ocean. And all of these, you know, here are people who have never been on a ship. If the case they're going across the Red Sea, it could be, a, you say, well, it's a short trip. If you're going across the Indian Ocean, it's a long trip. See, but you're going across the Sahara, that's another long trip. So you lose a lot of lives. Slaves were literally worked and beaten to death on the plantations. Well, we have to admit that there was not a large amount of plantation slavery in the Arab slave trade, and we have given the reasons why. They changed their tune after the ninth century. 
But before that, they were using Africans very liberally. In order to calculate the number of African lives that were lost in the Holocaust, in the Arab Holocaust, we have to work from the number of slaves that were transported across the Sahara, the Red Sea, and the Indian Ocean. And the, the figure that I worked from was given by the Nigerian historian Inikori in the uh, journal Tariq, which is a journal of the Nigerian Historical Society. And he came up with a figure of 10 million slaves exported from Africa during the 1250 years of the Eastern slave trade. Well, if you would divide the numbers out, that figure comes out rather low. And after revision, I, I, I think that you see the, the average figure is 8,000 slaves per year. But there were periods in the Arab slave trade where, where the figures were way, way, way over that. See, and if you, I mean, 8,000 was nothing. <laughs> you see, so we have to believe that this figure is a little low. And it's much more difficult to get our accurate figures on the Arab slave trade as compared to transatlantic slave trade. Not to say that any of these figures are very accurate. So I use a figure of 15 million as my base figure. Now what we can assume with great force is that for every slave, and this is, I think, is a very conservative estimate, for every slave that you land, land in Damascus or Baghdad or in Goa, in India, you see, or in Cairo, or in Tripoli, all of those border towns across the Mediterranean, remember they had to cross that Sahara, for every slave successfully landed there, which is what the figure talks about. They only talk about the, the, the slaves that come over. Two slaves were lost for every one that was landed. And anybody will tell you that that is a very conservative estimate. Right. Right. So right away, right away, you're looking at 30 million. See? Now, if you look for that 1,250 years, and you think of the number of generations that you had, and how many slaves died in captivity, because slaves died in captivity by suicide, because they were simply beaten to death, the kind of work that they did was hazardous, because slaves were used in mining in the Arab world, although they took them off the plantations. They used them in mining because they had better physical control over them in the mines. That was hazardous work. See? So you got to look at the numbers during captivity. Now how I did it was to look at, at the, the European figures for um, America and South America. And what you find is that if you take the number of people coming over, you see, that were brought over in slavery, you had well over 20 million that came, were landed in the West, well over 20 million. Yet at the end of slavery, if you added up all of the Africans in the Western Hemisphere, you didn't get 20 million. And I can tell you that the most slaves were in the United States of America and of course in Brazil. Brazil had 6 million, America had 4 million. And if you add up all the rest of the other people, see, right, they did not come to 10 million. So how is it that you brought over 20 million and you, all of that time, and these people were breeding, because remember these people were breeding slaves. Breeding slaves was big business. The answer is that you were beating them, working them to death. Then you get the statistic that the average life of a young African stirred slave on the plantations was eight years. 
So, we say that if you take that total that we had, then at least that amount of people must have died over that 1250 years. So if we are looking at 15 million, right? We are saying that another 15 million died because you harassed them, beat them to death over all the generations that you had for 1,250 years. So now you're going to 45 million. Now what is the percentage that died crossing the Sahara or the Red Sea or the Indian Ocean? Remember I told you about the case where a caravan came and 1,500 died from thirst. Well, I was nice and kind and I said, if we are looking at, if we are looking at 15 million, right? I'm saying that 20% mortality rate on the caravans. This is much, this is a better rate than was on the ships because you know that on the ships coming across where the conditions were more hazardous, we will admit, it was as high as 25 and 30% mortality rate on those slave ships. Even crew had a mortality rate of around 18, 20 percent. The crew and their conditions were superior to the dense packed Africans on all those slave ships. So that's another three million. So we're looking at a grand total for the eastern slave trade of about 48 million. 48 million in the Arab slave trade. And this is the minimum. It could be very much higher than that. But for 1,250, and we, we can't stop at the 1,250 here because they're still enslaving us. Still enslaving us. And as far as I know, they could be still castrating us too. Well, the slave trade has ended, quote unquote. And we have to ask the answer, why? I want you to ask the answer, I, I want to ask the answer myself, why? I said, why did we Africans allow ourselves to be enslaved by the Arabs and the wicked white men of the West, the Aryans? and decimate us for such long periods of time without a unified, unconcerted response. Damn it! Don't you realize that sometime that African life is being destroyed? I don't care what tribe you belong to. Hell! No, I mean you're going to say that we live in a time of enlightenment. So here am I, I'm an African Caribbean man, and if I hear that they kill my African American brother, or African South American brothers somewhere, I get mad. But you're going to say, well, we know now that if, if, they, if they kill him, they would kill me. But damn it, <laughs> 500 years ago, we should have realized the same thing, or a thousand years ago. There was no distinction in who they were snatching. There was no distinction. Now, I don't know why. I tried to look at the thing, and this is, if all my analysis, this is one of the most I mean, try and see if you can help me on this. I came up with five points that may have accounted for why we behaved the way we did. The first one was slavery was acceptable among the nations. And it's a fact that during the major portions of the periods over which our Holocaust occurred, slavery was a acceptable practice of the law of nations. But the brutality of the slave trade, again, it, this is not sufficient to explain. Racial awareness. Africans lacked racial awareness. Now this is a big one. I think there's some truth in this. Now we are not as racially aware as other people. And I, now I, I speak from my experience in the Caribbean, which is a good experience because we have there all, we have the white, yellow, and brown, and the black. The only thing we don't have down there is a red man because they wiped him out a long time ago. But when you live among these different people, you are very much aware of racial differences. Because although you pretend and say that there's no color prejudice down the Caribbean, you do know that a Chinaman is a Chinaman, and he don't want to mix with you. And he's very racially aware as far as you're concerned. You know, when he has his association, you dare don't put your black, you know what, in there. He's in there organizing. The Arabs have their organization and they're organizing. The East Indians, a uh, cocky set of brown fellas over from over in Asia, they have their organization. You don't dare come near there. So we know that. You see, People are racially aware, and as for the white man, we know how racially aware he is. But all these fellas are racially aware. White, yellow, brown, or red. And by the way, a lot of people don't know that the Red Indians had slaves here in the United States of America too. Yes, sir, the Cherokee Nation had a whole lot of slaves. Yes, sir. Yes, madam, they did. Everybody, everybody had Africans as slaves. 
Uh, before we form alliances with people, we better find out the truth about them. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, you can go in any library, go to the Newark Library, you'll see what they call it, red, red over black. There's another famous book on the whole that. Red Indian slavery. And they had us as slaves. It was trading with us with the white man. Yes, sir. Mm. Technology gap. During long periods of our Holocaust, the invading predators, Arab and Iron, had a decisive advantage in weaponry over our African ancestors and kinsmen. This is another good point. Religion. Africans are and have always been deep religious people. Both in slavery were quick to hand over their religions to Africans. You see that religion thing? You know, you, you know how King, what King George did with that Bible, did you? He put in that for those phrases about he who was of wood and who draws of water, be pleased to remain in the establishment of the law that placed thee. That wasn't in no Bible before. You didn't need no word of God that said that. Well, he put it in for you. And we used to sing it and love, love it up and, you know? Yeah. See what I mean, brothers and sisters? Even the very book that comes to you, you got to check it out. Whether it's called a Bible or a Quran, be sure that it's the authentic thing. And if it's to submit to somebody and be their slave, you got to ask questions about that. Now the final one that I said, and I think there's a lot of truth in this, is tribalism. In much of Africa, economic, social, and political organizations based on the tribal unit. Now there is an explanation. Chancellor Williams talks about this tribal unit. And we were survived because the tribal unit was necessary after the Holocaust that happened to us in Northern Africa and we were dispersed. And this tribal unit, this group, which maintained itself and made the great migrations, allowed us to survive. And we did, we did survive and we did come out of the tribal unit to create the great nations of Ghana and Mali and Songhai, the great nations of Zimbabwe and all that. But tribalism persisted in Africa. And it was the way that the European and Arab was able to get into set tribe against tribe. And to enter into those competitions for chieftainship. And to favor one clan or against another clan, you know. <laughs> so these are some of the factors that we have to question as to why we did that. Now the effects of the Holocaust in the Arab world, <laughs> well, <coughs> Here, I, you know, I don't like this name thing. I talk about that. With psychological slavery, you know, it's still with us today. We have the Jesus complex, and we now we are, have the Muhammad complex. <laughs> no. I'm looking at some names here. Ibrahim, Abdullah, Jorge, Alejandro, Charles, Robert, Henri, Jean-Francois, Django, Agostino, Annette, Maria. Lima. You know, none of those names is African. They're all alien, Arab or European. But we love those names. Claudette, Maria. Hmm? <laughs> Don't sound sweet. It sounds so sweet. Or does it sound sweet? Will you like to call your daughter Makeda instead of Maria? Or Nzinga instead of Annette? You've got to think about it. Now, one thing that we know psychologically, I know you're getting a little restless now, but I ain't finished with you yet. You know I'm going I'm to get you here and put this into your head so you come out of here with something in that that you've never heard before. <laughs> the African tradition and value system. The African tradition and value system. That's one of one things we have lost because of enslavement and this great diaspora. These high moral standards have been debased in many areas of the diaspora, and even the mother of Africa, by association with Aryans and Arabs, two races which are notoriously prone to homosexuality and lesbianism. Oh, you didn't know I was coming with that? You know I'm never going to let you go without that. The practice of lesbianism derives its name from the Greek Mediterranean island of Lesbos. The subtle, steady infusion of homosexual values and ideals from the surrounding alien culture into African community of diaspora is a menace that must be recognized, attacked, and eradicated. 
No, the rape and spoliation of African womanhood by the white man, Arab and European, during the periods of our enslavement, have created a wide assortment of color and phenotype in the diaspora. Now, you know, I like to talk about the Caribbean, you know, because <laughs> we come over here and we say we're such bad dudes and everything is all right down below there, but it ain't all right at all. Because if it's so all right, why is it that we don't have power throughout the Caribbean? Why can't we invite our African brothers and sisters to come down and enjoy the Caribbean with us? Why do our posters tell us about white people coming down to enjoy the sands and beaches? And we got 35 million beautiful black people up here who should be down there with us, taking over every square inch of the place, right? Right, right. Ain't happening, though. Look at the things that we have. We worried about color. And look at this classification. There's a famous uh, Jamaican classification. You have passing for white, high brown, low brown, teasing brown, plain black, and pot black. Ooh. But that's nothing compared to uh, the divisions that you had in Haiti. <laughs> Boy, they had so many different ones. They divided down to an ethnological unit of one sixty-fourth part of Aryan blood. That means they had 64 different classifications. <laughs> Man. We were crazy. Now, I mean, I know all you don't laugh now, you know. I, I remember a little old friend of mine now. He made a movie called School Days. You, you forget that? <laughs> you got some problems like that right over here. They ain't gone away yet. You got some people that think that they're qualified for leadership just because of the color of their skin. And something else. Right here in America. So we all got some bad faults. That's why we're not ruling the world now. No, we got to get rid of all those faults, clean up our minds. I'll leave some of this for when I finish this book I'm writing. Now, the last thing I got to talk about before I close is reparations. And I want to make it clear. Reparations have got to be by the Europeans, of course. White Americans, Germans, Frenchmen, Englishmen, Spaniards, Portuguese, all of them. And the Jews. And the Arabs. <laughs> Saddam Hussein. Hafiz Assad. Hosni Mubarak. All of those dudes have to pay reparations. Because they enslaved us for 1,300 years. That's a long time to be under the whip to the era. Now, what are the reasons for reparations? We demand reparations for the following reasons. One, the murder, mutilation, and torture of our ancestors and kinsmen during our enslavement. Two, the wages which were not paid to our ancestors and kinsmen during the periods of chattel slavery. The pain, suffering, and mental cruelty to which our ancestors and kinsmen were subjected. The possessions and property which were lost to us when we were forcibly removed from our homeland of Africa. The loss of our freedom during slavery. That's five reasons for reparations, and I'm certain we could find more. Now, in 1989, when I first wrote this little paper, which I've been quoting so liberally from, I did a calculation on the reparations that were owed to the Africans of the Caribbean. Now, it's easier to do, it was easier to do because I had a baseline to work from. What I used was the amount of money that was given to the white planters of the Caribbean in 1834 to compensate them for the slaves. And that was 30 million British pounds, which was 120 million uh, US dollars. And how did I start my calculation? I said, well, there were 16 generations of slaves up to the time of 1834. And I worked that out roughly. So this is a general technique for working out. 
And I'm saying, therefore, that if I have 120 million for the worth of this generation, and there were 16 generations of slaves during slavery, then when you work that figure out, you have $1,920,000,000. Now, because we are modern Africans and we know that interest is always involved in calculations, okay. we calculate at the rate, at the very conservative rate of interest of 5%, and we apply the well-known compound interest formula. You can't see it from here because I hold it up. A is equal to P into bracket 1 plus R over 100 to the power T, where A is the amount, P is the principal or initial amount, R is the rate, and T is the time. Now when you apply that formula for the period, you get your P is the 1 billion 920 million, your R is 5%, and your time was from 1834 to 1989. It's 155 years. Now when you work out that amount, you come to this awesome figure. <laughs> Let me just count the amount of zeros and then I'll... <laughs> you have nine zeros and in front of that you have 3,694,900. I don't know how to describe that. In... Okay, let, let me give it to you. It's 3.695 to the power of the Caribbean. I mean, I talk of, again of Jamaica because I'm very familiar with there, but of every dollar that is raised in taxation in, the, in Jamaica, more than 50 cents of that dollar goes to service the external debt owed to the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The latest figures that I had for Africa show that the total debt of the 30-something countries in sub-Saharan Africa is uh, in excess, and this figure was from about 1986, was in excess of 310 billion dollars. It's much greater now. Mm. So you see that the load that we are carrying can be relieved by reparations. Now people talk about the passage of time. I don't agree. The passage of time cannot affect the validity of our claims for representations. No statute of limitations can run against monumental and massive genocide. The records of the Holy Bible are a direct guide for us at this time. From the book of Numbers, chapter 14, verse 18. The Lord is long-suffering of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. We have to away with us the third and fourth generation of our enslavers since the institution of slavery was ended in the period 1834 to 1900. Bill Clinton and Al Gore listened to our cry for reparations. In conclusion, I say... No race of people can disregard your history. They do so at their very peril. But the African, above all others, has a special lesson to learn from the history of our enslavement and degradation. We must say more than any other people, never again, never, never, never again. God and history will judge the Arab white man of the East and the men of the West. But it is for, for us, the Africans of the diaspora, to prefer the bill of indictment. Brothers and sisters, I thank you, and I hope that the little words I've given you today make a lot of sense to you and will make you ponder for some time to come. Yes, sir. Thank you, yes, we have to the question. I need a rest. <laughs> Uh, sisters and brothers, before you move, before you do anything, I know Sister Juanita will harm me, and uh, Sister Imani would harm me if I don't. But if you want to get a book, the brother from New York sells this, the brother from New Jersey has had it. He's the only brother I know that sells this here book by Barry Gordon. Yeah. Excellent book. It is the best book that I find that basically breaks down a lot of detail, easy, that you can understand. The other one is 2,000 seasons. I, I can't say the name to the brother who even knows her, which is next to what we deal with the Arabs and what they did to, the, did to us. And the third book, what the brother sells here, is the invention of Egypt, the last 30 year domination of Roman, of Roman domination. Now this here book is when you really want to talk to, um, what's the young brother that's, that spoke here about we brother Trush? When you really want to get into the exact names of people that he was naming, this is a scholarly work book. This isn't what's called easy book, but if you get into this here book, believe me, 
you be able to talk to anybody wherever they are about any subject when it deals with these here Muslim brothers and, and like you said, the Arabs anyway. And the Arab invasion of Egypt, the last 30 year domination of, of the Romans. That's a scholarly word. Um, I mean, you did so many points that basically, it, it's like you say, all people put, I, I found a lot of times, I go to a lot of lectures, and one thing I found out right now here, and I went to one last meeting somewhere else right around not too far from these arms, and the brother who was giving it, he said one thing at the end. He said that he wished that we wouldn't talk about the religions and this and that, and that maybe we can keep it on par and don't talk negative about the religions. But at the same time, we're talking about there's about the African brothers walking around the street. And then, and then the mess that we're in, like the brothers say here, we got to put everything on the table and reanalyze it and be willing to talk about everything. And this is one of the few places you can go where we talk about everything and everybody, including ourselves, and how we're going to get out this mess that we got ourselves in. And I think we should give ourselves an applause being able to do this. There's some of us here that go to the slave theater. They don't even have question and answer period no more because they start so late and end so late. But this is a place where if you don't agree with this brother, you can get it on with him right here. And, um, Anytime. You know, I just, I just like to, to, to thank him for coming because I believe our people put too much faith before the facts. And once we deal with the facts, everything will change, including faith. Thank you so much. You're my brother. I enjoyed the lecture very much. And I wanted to ask you, what are the governments in Northern Africa of Libya, Algeria, Egypt, Mauritania, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Arabia, what are they doing to stop the uh, African slave trade? And what has the OAU been doing? I don't think... Uh I am not aware of anything that the OAU is doing as a body to stop this slave trading. The reason why is that they, they are afraid to confront this issue because it's such a sensitive issue between Muslims and Christians. Oh yes, my sister, but our African brothers and sisters are not ready to face this issue of the Arab and the African. This has been something that's been going along for a long time. I mean, the very fact that you had an official end of slavery in Mauritania on July 1980 tells you that something awful wrong was going on for a very long time. 1980 is just the other day. That's to, less, um, less than 13 years ago. It ain't issue ancient history. And it's still going on, sister, as you say because our people will not face this for religious and other reasons. If the fact is that it's done by a Muslim and I'm a Muslim, then I'm not going to call it. Now, I don't like to bring this up. Maybe I shouldn't, but it was personal. I remember when my daughter died in Brookdale Hospital in Brooklyn in 1974. I took up the matter with several prominent people Christian and Muslim in New York and nothing came out of this issue. My daughter was turned out of the hospital by a Muslim, Cyrus Ahmadi. Now when I first approached the Muslims they said they would be going to defend the son of the prophet's daughter, uh, Mr. Garvey's granddaughter, but by the time they realized it was a Muslim I never heard any more word from my Muslim brothers of the mosque. And the Negro politicians of Brooklyn, they didn't touch it because some of them were on the board of Brookdale Hospital. So don't wonder why these facts are not taken up. If people are getting money or by have their religious leanings why they don't touch this thing, then that will continue. Because some of us, expediency above conscience and honesty. And this is a matter of conscience. You see, look at what is happening in the Sudan right now. Millions of our people are being destroyed in the Sudan. This war has been going on for over 20 years. The Dinka people of the Sudan are being destroyed. The Noors, all the people of the Sudan. These are African people. These are the Nubians. And it's the Arabs of the north of the Sudan, of the Sudan and of Egypt who are doing this. And they are being aided and abetted by by weapons that they are acquiring from their Arab associates, Gaddafi and all of those fellows. 
So don't ask why they wouldn't interfere in slavery. They're killing all people. Gaddafi has been interfering in Chad and Niger and other areas. He's pushing south. And that's why I have tried to show the people in South Africa that if you have the Arabs pushing from the, from the north coming down south and the white man pouring into the south, you're asking for destruction of the race. The first thing we have to do is clean up the pus and cancer in the south and get them all out. Yeah, but we, we don't want to fight on two fronts, sister. Nobody wins a war where you fight on two fronts and first deal with the devil in the south, then we come and we march north, then we go into the holy city of Jerusalem and bring the Arab over and spank his behind right in front of the whaling game. Amen. Ah! <laughs> Before you do anything further, we will bring a brother from the Sudan here early next month. Yeah, I'd like to hear that. I'll send you the information. Mm -hmm. Brother from the Sudan, because originally we were doing two programs, your program and his program back to back. But because we were getting Zach Kondo mm -hmm. at the time, we slipped in Zach Kondo. Okay, so there will be a brother from the Sudan coming here next month. And that, that point, I think we reached a stage now where we should be giving direct assistance to our brothers in the Sudan. Yes, sir. It is a very serious situation there. There is no reason why so many of us Africans outside should not be involved in, in, in this great struggle that's going in. Because this is the ultimate struggle of North and Northern Africa. I mean, what is occurring in the Sudan? This, it, it, it is the descendants of Kemet who are there in the Sudan who are being murdered by the Arabs. I just want to say that I enjoy your speech and very enlightened. And I just want to make a statement that you would not something one of the brothers say a few minutes ago about we should do business with each other. Now, I live in Newark, and about last month, when they were building the mosque in South Orange Jazz or New York, I'm pretty much a Muslim now. And I think it's about that every day they had a bunch of looking like Arabs or white people or Chinese and somebody to pull their mosque. Some, you saw what I mean? I have never seen anything so disgraceful in my life. I'm not, I'm not teaching hatred, but the people who enslaved us killed black men when they got old, they couldn't do no more work in the Middle East, and the Muslims supposed we love black people, we want to help black people. But you passed by the mosque, last month, sir, in this city, they had a bunch of white looking people doing their work. They couldn't find one black man to do the work after the black people built this whole country on slave labor. I want to say one more thing. <laughs> and these people are sick people. Then they come and tell you to buy their buy they paper, buy their paper, but they, they're not, they don't contribute to black people. Um, and they call themselves Asiatic black man, like you say. I'm an African black man. I don't care what nobody say. Don't come to my face like no Asiatic black man. Not that I hate other people. I'm, a, I'm an African black man. And uh, also, the Muslim women from that mosque, if you looked in the paper a couple of months ago, they was demonstrating Muslim black people in America. This show about black Negro. It was demonstrating talking about what the Russians are doing to the Muslim women over there. Right, 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 right. What they're trying to say, they don't understand that's the ancestors coming up, rebellion now, that's our payback. And you would never go to that mosque and get, and that whole mosque on South Florida, and I can see it because I'm not afraid to see it. You could get 10 women or 10 men out of that mosque to demonstrate if something was happening to a natural right. black person right. and then go to that mosque. You right. could get, you could get 10 out of that mosque. So that's not black now, now, and also, anytime somebody has sold their birthright and say that they, that their uh, religion or their uh, destiny or their pyramids and Mecca, you got to be crazy. How can somebody say, my home base is Mecca? My home base is Africa. I think that these people should be held accountable for saying such craziness. Because how can, how can my home be Mecca? I mean, I'm not, I don't, maybe I'm not trying to hate the air, but I mean, I don't have a love for it at the same time. But what I'm trying to say, I, they go hugging the air and kissing the air, and the air will be frowned up at these schools. They don't want to be part of them. How, how do you expect that your slave master, or anybody that ever enslaved you, is going to turn around in 1993 and love you? They are completely insane, and they're going crazy. That's all I got to say. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Uh, can anybody in here? Can anybody in here, you know, as well as I know, that the nation of Somalia is 99, whatever percent, almost 100% Muslim, right? That's right. They They are, they are. Right? All these Africans that be going to that mosque, that mosque number 25, they ain't open their mouth and get it. Other than that, they're not Muslim. They're not Muslim. Now, what's going on in Somalia? They're not Muslim. 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 They're not
we will, but we will not even mention the Mount Sinai on Brantford Place. All right, which is controlled by the Arabs. That's right. All right, totally controlled by the Arabs. I've seen these brothers suck up to the Arabs. Anytime an Arab said, well, they get some mom, some mama, they come, whatever, 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 with the kufi and with the, they be hooked up and all like that, it's over. That's right. It's, that is God. That's right. All right, we got the Jesus priests, and like the brother was saying, we got the Mohammed priests. Now, we get ready to get a little bit of the larger priests, too, now. But name one brother or one group in the Muslim, African American Muslim community that has spoken up about the violence that's being done to our brothers and sisters in Somalia and they're Muslims just like them. That's right. Don't forget black people. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, I would have to say, the nation of Islam has spoken up under the Minister of Coming to support the people of Somalia. I have a videotape home right now where he had a group of Somalians at the mosque recently, uh, both male and female, who was there. And he spoke up very strongly in their behalf about what was happening there. I'm talking about the nation of Islam, not the people on South Zone yet. We don't allow white people and anybody else to their temples. Or the group just now here on the uh, rapid place. The nation of Islam, you know, takes a very close approach back saying. Now these two must be the same. I thank you for the But still and all, the new side come. Alright, come on. Brother, they have not done anything to my knowledge to claim their own heritage as African. This is exactly what I was saying. The day was something different. I was saying that the nation of Islam, other than the Farrakhan, has taken a strong stand in support of the people of Somalia. Oh, just about everybody else black. Regardless of what y'all might think of but what I'm saying is that the student Muslim community, to our mind knowledge, has been exactly what you have said. They have not spoken at all in support of the speaking of the uh, people of Somalia. They are really black to the Arabs. You know, I, I, I agree with you on that, but uh, the Muslim community does not take a universal stand on, you know, uh, you know, on this issue. There are Muslim groups uh, who are very nationalistic, who take a very pan-Africanist uh, approach, and there are those in the Sunni Muslim community, and some other ones who are basically pro-Arab. Whatever the Arabs say is correct. You know, so you have to make a distinction between the two. As a matter of fact, the nation of Islam is having its first international savings day in Ghana in 1994, where Farrakhan has taken over maybe three or four thousand people. Uh, my brother, I just have a quick question. Uh, as an organizer, uh, I know you had to deal uh, with that institution, that is the church. And then how do you uh, approach you know, a situation like that whereby people are sectarian in their thinking and the life? Because at the same time, we need them in the liberation movement to fight you know, for their you know, self-determination. What then is the realistic approach? You know, because uh, there is that antagonism. But we need to go beyond it. Well, we um, we take we follow the, the teachings of Marcus Garvey. He's very clear on this. He says, "Let no religious scruples divide us." So, in the UNI and ACL, we have no formal religious affiliation. Now, I know you will say that we had the African Orthodox Church, but the reason for the African Orthodox Church was that we need to have the emphasis on the Black God. You see, if you have a black God, then you have a black Allah, and you have a black Jehovah. These problems don't arise. See, the first thing is for you to accept that your God is black like you. The white man can have a white God, the yellow man can have a yellow God. The brown man is brown God, but we as Africans must have one God, the God of Africa, who made us in his own image and likeness. And that is the problem, that's the way we have to approach it. We should not attack religions, and we in the UNIA do not attack religions. But we point out the error and falsity of overzealous religious thought, which makes a man into less than a man, because he's guided as the same way 
as a donkey or a horse is guided by someone who has an intellect and is using reasoning to put him along a path without even flogging his behind. And that is what religion is doing. It is putting you along a path without even applying force to you. You are submitting. And therefore we say, you cannot submit. You must think logically and say, is my God colorless? And if God is colorless, then how can he be a God for you? I mean, if you accept that God made you in his own image and likeness, and I don't know anybody who says no to that, then what is your image and likeness? Your God, if you are black, then your God has got to be black. And once you accept the blackness of God, you see, this is the eighth and final concept of Garvey's. Marcus Garvey laid down eight building blocks for us, and I'll just give you them again. African identity, African pride, African self-reliance, African economic power, African unity in the national international sense, a great central nation in Africa. Apply science and technology to the work of African nation building and African racial reconstruction. And the final and eighth concept is, our God is black, we must have an African image of the Godhead. Right. And that's it. For those eight principles, you don't have any problem organizing or thinking. But you have to state them clearly to the people. And the people will understand. And if you look at religion now, you'll see that black liberation theology is taking hold all over the place. That's why all these people are on the defensive. And that's why so much Arab money is being spent in America to convert the 35 million potentially very strong nation of America towards the Muslim way of life. First of all, I just have to say good evening to you. Um, it was a pleasure getting to speak. My name is Corey Giles, and I, I just, you know, we, we touched on a lot of interesting subjects this evening, you know, as far as, as, far as religion and, and the history of the African, you know, but my, my question would be to you is, is, is how do we handle, how do, how do we take this and then put it into our everyday life as far as the children, you know, that's in the urban areas now, where I live, you know, in the projects and in the cities and in the, in the, in the ghettos. How do we generate this, this energy, this, this, these positive, you know, philosophies and these positive, you know, elements of knowledge to these kids who basically, you know, are not religious, you know, and basically are just, you know, living to survive their day, you know, and I'm kind of confused, you know, I don't want to be a preacher and stand on the corner because they won't listen to me, you know what I'm saying? So, my question to you would be, how, how would I generate this positive vibe that I feel in, in this knowledge and try to get it to my younger sisters and brothers, you know what I'm saying, and try to get them maybe to, to understand and try to, try to uh, uh, respect themselves as, as, as the uh, forefathers of civilization and understand that they have the power and the knowledge you know, to, to um, rise, up, rise above the situation that they're living in. That would be my question. God, let me answer you. Um, the only way you can do that is through a organization. That is, you, if you do not take part in organization, then you yourself are a part of the problem which we are trying to solve. See? Now, first of all, the kind of action that you are saying is taking place not only in the United States of America, but in Canada and in the United Kingdom and in the Caribbean, and also in Africa, in different places, where our children are being taken as an early age and taken out of the traditional system and being taught in shoelaces and schools, some of which are actually part of the public school system. I was recently in Detroit, and where they have a Marcus Garvey Academy in the public school system. They also have a Malcolm X Academy and a Martin Luther King Academy. Now these are what are called independent and empowered schools within this country. And those schools, the principles of the name, people's name are being taught in the schools and African nationalism is being taught in the schools to these children at an early age. You go in there and you see children able to recite the, um, the um, what you call it there, were the Karengas things, the Nguzu Saba, they, and explain it at an early age. They are taught the principles of Marcus Garvey, but what Malcolm X said, and this is applied with science and technology, so that they are well ahead of an advance. 
Now, they are in a controlled environment, so it is for us to establish controlled environments. Now, I gave you an indication of a very unusual situation, but there are many private schools in the, in the, in the cities where I've been, where they have garbage divisions. I have noticed private schools. For instance, there's a very famous one in Los Angeles, Dr. Anion Palmer. And there you have children at the age of 12 or 13 doing very advanced mathematical work. And they are very consciously aware. You go in there and see those children painting, and they are painting Marcus Garvey, they are painting Malcolm X, and they are reciting poetry. I went to Canada, to Toronto, and was taken to a special school like this on a Saturday morning. And there the children were. And it was amazing to see, to me, a little African-Canadian child get up and write up and read his poem about my father and about what my father stood for and what African nation would mean. That little child was only 10 years old. So you know it's happening out there. But we don't have enough of it. Now I say get, get into organizations. Get into organizations like this. Get into the UNI and ACL. And let us establish these schools. We have these plans. Take care of the control, the teaching of our own children. The Jews do it. The Chinese do it. The Jews will go to school, a public school, right through the week. But he goes to his shule all that time in the evening on Saturdays at his shule. And he's getting training in Jewish education. And what makes him a very special person different from the rest of the community? You see, if we know that we're special people, then we ain't going to take no gun and kill each other. If we know that we're a special temple created by God, then when you look at another special temple like yourself, you ain't going to hurt it. You're going to look out there at the beast and you're going to deal with him just like what Sister Soldier said. Okay, um, my question that I have for you is this. Um, I, well, I, I guess I should be ashamed really to say that I just recently found out about your father from a friend of mine who was a Africans are intelligent people. Nobody has to force us to accept something. I think we can have a lot of good feeling you know, here is that you cannot confuse Islam with Arabs. Every religion has been misused by unscrupulous people. So with Marxism, for that matter. I just want to know, was Christianity us or did we just accept it? This is an open forum, so sometimes we're going to be stepping on some, some people's psychological barriers.